Can you hear me? I can hear you. We'll set to go, Thomas. Welcome to the Thomas Kilbasinski podcast, Sherry. With Ken, you. <laughs> let's uh, let's start off here with we're going to talk about Africa with customs, import and export. Right, this is your expertise, right? Yeah, what we'll do, we're going to speak a little bit about those um, people who are interested in exporting goods to Africa or importing them into Africa. Uh, I've recently returned from uh, Cote d'Ivoire, it's in West Africa, and I was over there advising business people how to export their goods to the United States. A lot of the goods that are being exported to the United States consist of agricultural goods, uh, food products, and Africa especially West Africa, has a lot to offer the world. Um, Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, is the biggest producer of cashew nuts, uh, which is something that the United people in the United States are looking for. Very expensive nut, uh, lots of plantations over there, but the government of Cote d'Ivoire is also looking to export such things as mangoes, uh, pineapples, bananas, etc. And uh, they have also have textiles to export to the United States as well. The United States has an agreement it's called the uh, AGOA, Africa, African Growth and Opportunity Act, and it ends in 2025, and it allows Africans to send their goods to the United States um, free of duty. There's a preferential rate of duty for 30-some-odd African countries that want to send their goods here, as long as the goods are sent directly to the United States and certain requirements are met that have to do with labor, have to do with costs. And if they can prove that the items they're sending to the United States are, in fact, a manufacturer or product of uh, those countries, they come in free of duty. So there's a lot going on right now. Traditionally, West Africa has looked to Europe, not the United States, to send its products. But as everybody knows, Africa is a young continent. We have a lot of people over there <clears throat> who need work. The governments over there are very interested in getting people to do things, uh, providing them with employment. And there are a lot of employment opportunities now that the governments have uh, sort of changed their outlook and they realize they have to add value to the products they have over there. So in the, traditionally, in places like Cote d'Ivoire, they would grow cashew nuts and then export them raw to such places as India, Vietnam, and roasting would take place there. <clears throat> right now, it looks as though the Africans are going to start doing some of the roasting themselves. They're going to add value. And then those goods are going to come into the United States. And if people are interested in exporting to the United States, there's a few basics that they have to bear in mind, and I'll talk about that. One of the new laws affecting food products happens to be called the Food Safety Modernization Act. Now, Customs is the primary import clearance agency for the United States, but there are a number of other import agencies. One of the biggest import agencies, or the agency that has a lot to say about imported goods, is the Food and Drug Administration. And the FDA has a lot to say about imported foods. And right now, there's a law that everybody's got to be cognizant of, not just the people here in the United States, but people overseas. It's called the Food Safety Modernization Act. Why is there such a law? Because U.S. government's worried about security, security of food products. Why? Because one out of six Americans get food poisoning every year. And sometimes the food poisoning is serious. And the U.S. government has recognized that, yes, the U.S. needs goods from overseas, but we've got to make sure they're of the same quality, they're the same safety. Um, they, re they have the same safety standards in place that American-made products have or American-produced products that's one thing. Now, if you want to import goods into the United States, you, um, if you're the importer record, <clears throat> that is, you're the party importing goods into the U.S., you don't need to have a license. People don't need to be licensed in order to bring goods into the U.S. Sometimes the products that they want to bring in, yes, they do require a permit. And you may need a permit from the FDA, possibly a permit from the Department of Agriculture. Now, if you want to be an importer of record, you want to engage in commercial transactions, you have to have what's known as a customs bond. And when we're talking about a commercial importer, it means that you're bringing goods into the United States that are worth more than $2,500. And what you would do is, if you want to import, you would consult what's known as a licensed U.S. customs broker. And they can be found at every port of entry. The United States has 328 ports of entry. And by the importer having a continuous bond, 
This means that the importer is aware that he has certain obligations. And basically, it boils down to this. The importer is going to do the right thing. The importer is going to classify the goods that are coming in correctly, going to give value to the goods. The evaluation has to be correct. And there's a number of other things that have to be done, like observing the dictates, the regulations that come with the Food Safety Modernization Act. Now, we happen to be very close, or I'm very close to the Port of New York's Newark, uh, Port of Newark, New Jersey, and the code for that is 4601. Um, Newark is uh, it's a big port. It has Newark Liberty Airport and also has an ocean port. And um, the director of the port is known as a port director. And recently, Newark has a new one. Uh, now, as far as ocean cargo is concerned, Newark is doing extraordinarily well. Sometimes Newark is the number one port in terms of ocean shipments, ocean import shipments. The other big port is the port of Los Angeles, Long Beach. And that seems to be in the number one spot right now. But there's a lot that goes through Newark, New Jersey. And why is that? Because the port has the, time, has the facilities. It has the terminals. It's also close to the turnpike. Trucks can bring goods into the port and out of the port. Also located near rail lines. And um, as far as the port is concerned, the landlord is really the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. And um, it has quite uh, this number of other types of uh, um institutions or locations that have to do with importing like foreign trade zones that's something that the port is full of and that's where people can find employment and that's where a lot of things can do with imported and exported goods there's also customs bonded warehouses uh, as far as shipments go how much is examined by customs probably less than one percent maybe a little bit more um, customs does not is not in a position to open up every ocean container but if you're an importer, you've got to give all kinds of information to customs beforehand. Now, you're not going to be doing that because you don't have the software to communicate with customs. But that's where your licensed U.S. customs broker comes into play. The licensed U.S. customs broker can transmit this information electronically to customs through something known as the automated commercial environment. And uh, the broker will transmit information not only to U.S. Customs, but to other importing agencies like the FDA and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And then Customs or another agency may decide that an examination is in order. Now, the examination could consist of the government looking at your paperwork or looking at the information that you've sent to the government. But it could also wind up that your goods are going to be physically looked at. And if that's so, the examination of the goods is going to happen at what's known as a, uh, uh, it's going to be a private warehouse. Um, Customs does not normally examine goods in the public eye anymore, but they do have private warehouses where the office is stationed and um, the examinations are conducted there. If you're a first time importer bringing goods into the United States, what is the, what is the chance that your goods are going to be examined? Probably 95 to 99%. OK, um, and if they miss examining your goods the first time, customs in the FDA will look at your goods the second time. So your first shipment is very important and you've got to have the documentation. You have to have the information correct. Customs tells importers that they have to exercise what's known as reasonable care. Customs has never defined the term, but it really means that you can't make any mistakes when it comes to classifying your goods. Now, when I talk about classification, there's a great big book that customs brokers use and importers use, and it's called the Harmonized Tariff Schedule of the United States. If you printed out the pages in the book, well, the book would weigh about 16 and a half pounds. It's a huge book, and the government says that everything can be classified using this great big book. Now, the classification number is 10 digits long. And yes, your customs broker can help you. What is a customs broker? Customs broker is somebody or a company that is licensed by U.S. Customs. It has a fiduciary responsibility. That is, they can help. They can help um, pay the duties, if any be due, uh, for the goods, and also send fees into the government that may be uh, due. The customs broker can give you a lot of information about your product. Some of them very knowledgeable, but you've got to remember this: that ultimately, you, the importer of record that is the person who has the bond, you're ultimately responsible for getting the classification correct and putting the value on the goods uh, and making sure that that valuation of the goods is indeed correct. How many offices are there? 
Well, Customs is the largest law enforcement agency in the United States. And I know, normally, Customs has about 65,000 officers. It's not a few thousand right now, but the officers are in blue. And if you've ever traveled, you see them at the airport. They have uniforms, gold badges, and they wear sidearms, what have you. They are law enforcement, and it is a, really a law enforcement agency. And when you bring goods into the United States, customs officers don't need any reason at all to look at your goods. Uh, they can do so because, well, that's the law. They don't need anything like reasonable suspicion or probable cause or warrants or anything like that. They have absolute carte blanche. They can look at whatever they want to bring when you bring goods into the U.S. And the same thing, too, if you're sending goods out of the United States, customs officers can take a look at your goods. They're not restricted by having to have reasonable suspicion or probable cause. They don't need a warrant. So you've got to realize that really the Constitution exists but not necessarily on the border when you're sending goods in or sending goods out of the country. Uh, the Port of Newark is very busy. Uh, consists, as I said, of an airport. You also have a seaport there. If any of you travel to New Jersey Turnpike, you can see it. Um, it's around exit 14. And it's a big port. And there's a lot of work going on, a lot of new terminals, a lot of uh, um, also a lot going on at the airport. Uh, it's going to continue to grow. And uh, eventually, it's going to be a far more automated. It may go to seven days a week. Right now, the port operates five days a week. And if you're around the port on a Friday, you may see a lot of traffic. Why is that? Because people are trying to get their goods to the terminal so they can be exported from the United States. Now, people will say, well, what does customs have to do with exporting? Customs has everything to do with exporting. Customs has a role when it comes to importation. Yes, it's the primary clearance agency. But also when it comes to exporting, again, this agency can look at anything it wants to. And Customs works with a number of other federal agencies. One happens to be one that some of you may never have heard of, part of the Department of Commerce. It's the Bureau of Industry and Security, and those are the federal policemen for export control. And they can they work very closely with Customs. Uh, who else can be involved in the exportation project or uh, process or looking at exported goods? Could be local police departments. I'm a former customs officer myself. I was stationed at a number of ports, air, land, and seaports, and Newark happened to be one of them. And quite often I would work with local agencies. I'd also work with the New Jersey State Troopers, but I work with local police departments like the Elizabeth Police Department, Newark Police Department, Hudson County. I'd be dealing with Union City. Um, number. Why? Because a lot of automobiles are exported from the port of Newark. And if you're going to export automobiles or anything that has a motor, you've got to pay special attention. There's special regulations, special rules that go with exporting automobiles from the United States. Now, you're probably not familiar with the customs regulations, but that's the rule book that customs uses. And it's Title 19, Code of Federal Regulations, called the Customs Regs. And there's a section in there, 192, that pertains to automobiles. And if you want to export goods from the United States, you also have to classify. Just when goods come into the United States, you have to classify. When goods leave the United States, you've got to classify those goods. And you're going to be using a book called the Schedule B book. It's basically the same as the Harmonized Tariff Schedule, but it's for exports. And it's all part of what's known as the Harmonized System. Now, if you're exporting goods that are worth more than $2,500, you've got to have somebody file something electronically for you. And it's called a shipper's export declaration, or more correctly these days, an electronic export invoice. And that's required. Goods that are worth more than $2,500. Why? Because the U.S. government likes to collect statistics. It does so for imports, and it does for the same thing for exports. And it wants to be able to put together a picture to give Congress so Congress can decide what to do in terms of trade, trade policy. Now, if you're paying attention to the news, you probably heard that um, Donald Trump has indicated that if he becomes president, he's going to impose a 10% tariff on goods coming into the United States. What is a tariff? A tariff is an import tax. What is the average rate of duty or taxation on goods now coming into the United States? About 1%, maybe 1.1%. That's quite a change from World War II. At the, when World War II ended, the average rate of duty was about 54%. So if you wanted to import goods into the United States, well, you had to be prepared to pay a lot of money, 54% on, on the goods. Right now, that's not so. We have a lot of free trade agreements, and the free trade agreements have made it possible to bring goods in at very low rates of duty. 
This has also harmed our economy. We, again, you know that we used to have an industrial economy here in the United States. A lot of things have moved offshore. However, we still do produce quite a bit for export here. And up until recently, the three biggest exports from the port of Newark happened to be used paper, used scrap metal, and a lot of used household goods. But we also, from the state of New Jersey, does quite a bit of exporting. A lot goes through the port, and that includes a lot of uh, automobile parts. It also includes a lot of chemicals and also a lot of metals like platinum. And quite of that is exported from the U.S. As far as imports go, what are we importing these days? We import just about everything. The clothing that you're wearing is probably not made here in the United States. There's not much left in terms of an, or, uh, a textile industry here in the U.S. Uh, same thing with shoes. Same thing with a lot of foods right now. If you look at um, your foods, sometimes they have labels. Where is the food produced? Mexico, Chile, etc. There's more food coming into the United States, and that's one of the reasons that the government passed the Food Safety Modernization Act. And if you really want to know more about importing, I suggest this to you. Go to this website. It's Customs website. It's www.cbp.gov. And there's a lot of information made available there. The government has also provided such things as these guides. They're called informed compliance publications. And you can learn the basics about importing. If you've never imported before, this is a place you can go to for information. And the government is under an obligation to provide you with information. There was something called the Customs Modernization Act back in 1993. And at that time, it was decided that no longer could the government remain silent when it came to uh, presenting import laws and regulations and procedures to the public. And Customs has come up with a very good website, and you'll find a lot of helpful information there. You can learn about the harmonized tariff schedule, classification. You can learn about valuation. There's also a book that's available on the website. It's called Importing into the United States, and it's free for downloading. And it's a very good primer, you know, a very good book uh, for those who know nothing about importing. I can also suggest to you, if you're interested in importing or exporting, that you can go to Barnes & Noble or you can buy online a book called Import Slash Export for Dummies. And it's the author is John J. Capella. Import Slash Export Kit, K-I-T, for Dummies. Very cheap. It's a soft cover book. And you'll spend about, oh, you get a used book for about $12, $14. And it's really very helpful. It'll provide you with all kinds of websites that you can go to. There's a lot of free information out there. And free is good. And there's no reason that you can't become very knowledgeable about what's going on importing-wise and exporting-wise. But when it comes to importing, 99.9% .9 of all importers make use of a licensed U.S. customs broker. And that's, again, the middleman. That's the party who is between the government and the importing public. And customs brokers can provide you with guidance. They can provide you with a lot of information. And the customs brokers can also help you get that customs bond, which will allow you to operate as an importer. Now, again, you do not need a license to become an importer. You're placed on the honor system. And customs is going to say to you, go ahead, keep importing. And uh, we'll let you know when we have some problems with you. Now, one thing that you've got to do if you're importing, you have to keep records. Customs has put you on an honor system, but if Customs wants to know about a prior shipment, it'll ask you for documents, and you better come up with the documents. Okay, Record keeping is a big part of importing, but it's really the honor system. You have to declare to Customs. And if you want to know more about what I'm talking about, about this importing and the documents that are used, go to uh, the Customs website, www.cbp.gov, and download the importing into the U.S. book. Okay, very, very helpful. It's got to be updated. Customs hasn't updated the book in, oh, maybe 12, 15 years, but it still gives you the basics. And then take a look at the website if you want to see who the brokers are in your area. I'm also a licensed U.S. Customs broker. Um, I, you know, I did some importing for a number of years. I, I was engaged in that industry. And um, what can you import? You can import just about anything there's certain however there are certain countries you really have to worry about and uh, they're known as well i don't want to get too involved right now but certain countries you've heard about that have problems with the u.s could be cuba could be north korea sometimes you have to consult with customs before doing so and you may have to consult with an, a company uh, an association or agency called the office of foreign assets control 
when it comes to exporting, in some cases, you'll need an export license. 98%, 99% of the time, you don't need a license to export anything from the United States. But you've got to check some so-called bad guy lists before you export. And what determines whether or not you're going to need an export license? Again, the party you're shipping to. What part of the world are you shipping to? What country? What place? And then what is your item? And certain items have to get licenses from the Department of Commerce. Others, if they're military in nature, the Department of uh, Defense. So something else. And you go to another website, www.bis.doc.gov. And that's the Bureau of Industry and Security. And you can learn about a lot about exporting. And if you go to the customs website, there'll be some guides for importing and some guides for exporting. So my advice to you is do a little homework. You can also do very well if you set up an importing uh, agency or an importing company here in the United States. Um, lots of people are doing so. Again, you don't need a license, but you have to be advised that there are some things you need to think about before you import. So if you have any questions, you can go through Thomas, and um, if you'd like, you can contact me. As I said, my background, well, my name is Martin Bear. I'm located just outside the port of Newark. I'm a customs lawyer. I've also worked, as I mentioned, customs for many years. I used to be on land borders. I was at airports and seaports, mm -hmm. licensed customs broker. I was the export control branch. Other things I've been uh, involved with, um, been a special agent for the Department of Defense, and I've also been a prosecutor. So I've um, done a number of things related to commerce, and it's fascinating. And the United States is going to continue to import and be because we, there's a lot of things we don't have here anymore, we don't make here. So it also offers you opportunities. Um, if you know, uh, and if you have people overseas, in many cases, you can do quite well for yourself if you have the right network and you're located here in the US. Uh, a lot of times it's not gonna be the duty, it's not gonna be the import taxes that are gonna uh, upset you or, or cause problems for you. It's just, you have to pay attention to certain rules and regulations. And that's where a customs broker comes into play. Or you make use of a customs attorney to advise you. And the other thing, if you're going to set up a business, who's the party you need to talk to? You need to speak with an accountant, okay? Preferably a certified public accountant, and then you take it from there, all right? So download the book, Importing into the United States. Go online and buy the import slash export kit for dummies. And if I can help you in any way, if you think I can, get in touch with me. Right. <clears throat> Not a question. You, yeah. know, you said 30 countries in Africa. Can you name some of those countries that are... No, they're basically, basically, they're all the countries sub-Saharan Africa, not North Africa. North Africa, you're dealing with Arab countries, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, etc. It's, wow. it's basically for those countries that are below the Sahara. And practically every, I think really everybody below the Sahara qualifies. And if you bring those goods in from those countries, freaking goods... If they come into the United States directly, they don't go to, into the commerce of any other country. And you can prove that they're the manufacturer or the product or they were harvested in that country. They come in free of duty. And this, the idea is the United States government wants to help, wants to influence a lot of these African countries. So there's a lot of opportunity out there. But in addition to um, thinking about the fact you don't have to pay tariffs on a lot of the African goods, you have to bear in mind that if you want to bring food products in, you got to pay attention to safety. You got to pay attention to hygiene and this law called the Food Safety Modernization Act. And there's a lot more coming in from Africa right now. The port of Newark happens to be the port that basically has oversight when it comes to African shipments. And we're very fortunate to be in this area. So if you're interested in Africa, uh, what you can do is um, you can also um, look for certain organizations, certain associations that are in the New York, New Jersey area. And if you're interested in setting up a business for yourself, I can recommend that you contact the small business development centers. And there's a number of them here in the state of New Jersey. There's one in Newark. There's also one in Jersey City, New Jersey Small Business Development Center. And uh, they can provide you with all kinds of help. Same thing, too. You can also get help by contacting SCORE, S-C-O-R-E, consists of retired business executives, and they can help you establish your business and get it going. Uh, I can also make mention to you, start putting together a business plan. And no matter what you do, you're going to yeah. need a business plan. 
And you're never really going to be finished with the business plan. It's a work in progress, but it's something that organizations want to see that you have. Okay. So I can, again, I, I can present next time if um, Thomas will have me back. What I can do is I can present a PowerPoint presentation to you and we go through yeah. specifically Africa. And you'll get to see some images and very exciting right now. A lot going on in Africa. It's the youngest continent and African growth uh, is expected uh, to be sub truly substantial. The population of Africa is going to double by the year 2050. So, and there's a lot of investment taking place right now in Africa, all countries in Africa, but particularly West Africa. And I was amazed. I recently came back, as I mentioned, Cote d'Ivoire or the Ivory Coast. And I was in Abidjan, the capital, and I really couldn't believe how much progress had been made since my last trip there. My last trip there had only been a few months before, and then I had been there a year before. But there's a lot of money, a lot of investment going in, and the, the governments are very, the government Cote d'Ivoire, next to Ghana, the same thing, um, very helpful to those people who want to establish businesses and want to build and want to do things. All right. How many so, years of experience do you have dealing with? You have, probably at least have 30 or more, right? Excuse me, what was that? How many years of experience do you have doing it? Don't you have at least 30 oh, Well, years I used to ship. I had an office in Tema, which is right next door. That's Ghana. That's West Coast. And I had an office that I set up in Tema. And uh, I had worked with a friend of mine originally from Ghana. His uh, uncle happened to be the collector of customs in Ghana. And I used to ship all kinds of uh, goods to Ghana. Things like uh, spray starch, Irish spring soap, uh, food products, um, all kinds of tools and equipment and used automobiles. So there's a lot. Like right now, if you want to ship used automobiles to Africa, you have to be somewhat careful because the African governments no longer want older automobiles. They want newer cars. But there's a lot to be said for, uh, for West Africa in particular. It's booming. And people need things that are made here in the United States, over-the-counter medicines, also a lot of oil products for motor oil and motor oil treatment for automobiles, air filters. There's all kinds of people who are shipping to uh, Africa, and we would have some kind of uh, business um, entities around the port known as non-vessel operating common carriers. They're shipping companies. Most shipping in the United States is done by way of ocean. That 95% of all our exports are done by ocean. And the same thing with imports. 95% of everything coming into the United States comes in by way of ocean. Yeah. What about planes? What about jets? Yes, but they're usually reserved for more expensive items. And you'll see what's happening right now is that the prices of cargo or shipping containers is, um, is increasing. Why? Well, if you've been reading the news, you see what's going on in the Red Sea, that area around there. And there have been attacks on ships, so quite a number of companies have decided not to send their ships through the Red Sea and through the Suez Canal. And right now, some companies are making certain that the ships go by way of the Horn of Africa, and then they come up the Atlantic and then to the ports, you know, in New York and, uh, you know, Baltimore and also Europe. But shipping is becoming a bit more expensive right now. But there's a lot of opportunity, really. Africa is the place where growth is taking place, substantial growth. Mm -hmm. something that you shouldn't forget. And there's a lot of sites you can go to online uh, to see that. But, you know, you have to say to yourself, what am I comfortable with? What would I like to import? What would I like to export? And once you make that decision, you seek out information by way of the websites I've mentioned. Uh, also, another website, if you're interested in exporting to Africa, www.export.gov. Okay, it's really the website you need for exporting. A lot of free information is available there. Now, what I'm talking about is not exactly rocket science, but you have to be familiar with certain documentation. And that's where your customs broker comes into play. If you're going to be importing goods into the United States, you're not going to be putting together the invoice. The invoice is going to be put together overseas. You'll be receiving the invoice. But customs is very... Well, customs is very picky about invoices. The invoice has to be in English, and it has to have all kinds of information, and that's where your customs broker can help you out. You can relay that information to the people overseas, and you can make sure that your documentation is in good order. And the same thing when it comes to exporting. You're going to be putting together an invoice to somebody who's going to be using that invoice overseas. 
Uh, so you have to know something about the regulations of the country that you are prepared to ship to. So there's um, a lot of two-way trade going on, and it can be very profitable. And you may just want to pursue that. If you have people overseas that you know, you people that you can trust, you can put together a wonderful business for yourself. Again, if you have any questions, please get you know, please contact me, and I'll be happy to uh, I'll be happy to address your your problems. And I said we're going to be doing a presentation. It'll be on Africa. It'll be PowerPoint, and there'll be some handouts for you. So if you're interested, let Thomas know, and we'll let you know when we're going to put on a presentation. It should be in the next uh, couple of weeks. So there was a question I was trying to ask earlier, but maybe you haven't didn't hear it. How long have you been doing this? How long have I been doing this? I've been doing this for about twenty something years. Cool. Uh, yeah, I've been shipping. As I said, I had an office in Tema. I created an office in Ghana, which is right next to Cote d'Ivoire, and I would receive uh, ocean containers from the United States, containing all sorts of various products. Uh, so I've wow. been very heavily involved. I also work with a shipping company, and we specialize in shipping to Africa. And I've been working right now with the uh, with plantation owners and businessmen in Cote d'Ivoire, West Africa. On a steady basis for the last five or six years, I've gone back there many times. I recently spoke in Abidjan. It was the Cote d'Ivoire North America Business Forum, and I addressed hundreds of people, and it was all about sending their products to the United States, what's necessary. And I advised people that it's not rocket science, but you do have to do a little homework, but it's all doable. If other people have done this, you can do it too. And it's just sometimes people get stuck because they don't know where to go for the right kind of information. So I advise you, there's a free book that's available to you importing into the United States, available on the customs website, www.cbp.gov. And then go to Amazon or, you know, or, or go to Barnes and Noble and get import slash export kit for dummies, third edition. And the author is <clears throat> Thomas J. Capella, C A. P E L A, and he teaches at St. John's University. Very easy to understand book, packed with all kinds of wonderful information, and it will give you access to all kinds of websites. <laughs> so this is what I can recommend that you do in the in the interim until we get back to you with the presentation on Africa. Okay. Do you have any idea when this presentation is going to be? Whenever you'd like it, I can do oh, it. Oh wow! Okay. All I right. have presentations on Africa. I presented over there. I can do it with, uh, with food. Let's uh, let's address food. Also realize that if you're going to import things, things even like cosmetics are going to be uh, under the jurisdiction, not just of customs, but also of the FDA. FDA has a lot to say about products that come into the United States. 65% of all products coming into the United States are also subject to the jurisdiction of the Food and Drug Administration. And then we'll talk a little bit about containers. We'll talk a little bit about freight folders. We'll talk about the basics, the things that you need to know if you want to import goods or export goods. So we can do that next couple of weeks. Thomas will let you know. We'll put on a present sure. about Absolutely. Africa. I definitely thank you for your time. Jim. Oh, sure. My sure. pleasure, ladies and gentlemen. You know, thank you for having me, and I look forward to speaking with you again. No problem. Thank okay. you. Have a good evening. Thomas, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate everything. Thank you. Thank you. That went excellent. He knew exactly what he was talking.